today we are going to talk about the camera phone to create a virtual studio tour. And uh, just a little bit about myself before we get started. I worked at General Motors for 34 years in marketing and advertising. So I have a lot of background in video production, um, produced thousands of commercials for Chevrolet. And uh, basically, I'm going to apply some of that learning to you um, so that you can be successful in creating your own professional videos. Uh, I retired a couple of years ago, and now I'm a full-time artist. I started uh, my art um, about six years ago and started uh, with metal sculpture. And uh, I now also do ceramics as well as fused glass. And you can learn more about me um, on my website, Fusion of Iron and Earth, or you can like my Facebook page at Love My Art, or follow me on Instagram at Iron and Earth. So I hope to um, share with you some wisdom on what I've learned uh, in my career at General Motors, and then how I've been able to apply that to my art, um, and specifically in the medium of video. Okay, so, so um, I've broken the content into four areas. Uh, we're gonna start with content development. So it's what you are going to say. And then we're gonna talk about technical preparation. And this is going to help you take your content and make it feel more professional. And then I'm gonna spend a few moments talking about uh, InShot application, which is my number one recommendation for a free piece of software for you to use to edit your videos on your phone. And comes highly recommended by a lot of videographers. And then we'll wrap it up with talking about what to do with the video studio tour once you're done with it. So hopefully um, after this seminar, you'll feel confident to move forward and produce in your own video. In preparing for this seminar, I did some research and I watched dozens of studio tours, virtual art fairs, uh, just basically consuming what I could and what's currently out there. And there is a lot of good work that's out there today. But there wasn't a lot of great work. And I think what was missing is what I'm gonna talk about now. And ultimately, if you wanna engage your audience and build your brand and create a loyal following, you need to tell a compelling story. And the best way to do that is to make it personal and specific to you. So you're going to have to let the guard down a little bit. You're going to have to let people in. There might be a little soul bearing that's going on, but the important thing is, is that you be your authentic self and tell your true story. It's also important that you find a connecting point, something that links you to your potential buyers. You always wanna think about who's watching the video and why they would find what you're sharing with them interesting and why it makes a difference to them buying your art versus buying another person's art. So make sure you've got some sort of connection point that will make that potential client feel good about you and your art. And let's also remember having some emotional sentiment in your presentation. And this can come with practice. Some people are just super natural in front of the camera and they can be there themselves um, without a lot of practice. But a lot of people have a little more nerves, a little more anxiety. So my recommendation is to always see your best friend in that camera lens. You're talking to your best friend. So you wanna to talk to them like you would talk, talk to the camera like you would talk to your best friend. And that will also help you um, in creating that more personal and intimate experience for them. And in your content, the other thing I thought was interesting is there wasn't a lot of really interesting tidbits that made me feel like I was special or I learned something new or unique in a lot of these studio tours. I think it's important when you give them a peek behind the curtain of how you do what you do and where the work is made, that it isn't just a tutorial. It's you're providing a little bit of secret, a little secret knowledge that you have learned in your experience and you're embarking that 
um, to your audience so they feel they're special and they've got they know the secret now and I think that also helps your story be more engaging and your video be more engaging and then a little tip that I want to share with you here um, in order to make sure you have clear messaging and a lot of us have used this in training especially adult training is you tell them what you're going to tell them then you tell them and then you tell them what you told them and for some reason this really helps with comprehension so when you're building your story and you're building your content think about when you introduce yourself and what you're going to do in that particular video then you actually do what you told them you were going to do and then at the end you remind them of what you did right and I think it will help with the comprehension and it kind of buttons up the story. I have an interesting quote here that I hope will inspire you from Martin Scorsese. He says, your job is to get your audience to care about your obsessions. And I think that enthusiasm that you have for a particular obsession as you make your art is something worth sharing and it would be your idea to make that interesting. Okay. I have a, um, within the uh, presentation, there will be these links that I will encourage you to uh, click on later, and they will give you some more insight into um, uh, some of the topics that we're talking about. This particular link is an example of a studio tour that I think is good. And it's good to look at it and from a point of view of how to produce your studio tour. Her content is a little dry and boring, but I like the way the piece was edited together. So I want you to look at this from a technical point of view um, to provide you some, some tips and tricks, okay? All right, so let's talk a little more about content. So when developing your content, I have four key tips. The first one is prepare. Now, you don't have to write out a script because you're talking about yourself, but you want to stay organized and you don't want to uh, talk around a point. You want to get right to the point. And the best way to do that is to prepare an outline with simple bullet points of what you are going to say. Uh, this will also help you. Um, you can put them up in a cue card if you feel anxious or nervous about forgetting something uh, behind the camera and then no one will know the difference but the preparation here will make you come across succinct and it will keep your audience engaged because you'll be less likely to repeat yourself or less likely to take too long to get to a point okay the other trick i have for you is memorize your first and last sentence of what you want to say and these bookends will help make your overall presentation more memorable the reason is is if you're going to memorize it you're going to have an opportunity to write it down and by writing it down you will be able to perhaps write something that is a little more clever unique maybe use some alliteration in there or you have your catchphrase that you want to use. But to open up your uh, video with something that is memorized, it'll come across more professional and confident. And then when you exit your video, having that also memorized is a nice, <clears throat> excuse me, bullet point and exclamation point on the content. And again, it also, really the purpose here more than anything is to ease your nerves a little. The other trick that um, many of you will do this naturally, but it's worth talking about, and that is see and say. So see and say will help for greater impact and comprehension. And I'll give you a perfect example of an industry that does this perfectly. And that are, those are your cooking shows. You know, if you think about Rachel Ray, she'll say, two eggs and she'll show you two eggs a quarter cup of flour and she'll show you a quarter cup of flour then we're going to add a teaspoon of vanilla and food shows are perfect for laying out a see and say presentation and so like i said it helps with impact helps with comprehension 
and it's also a familiar format so your audience will feel comfortable watching you and there'll be no confusion um, especially since in many cases you might be showing a new tool that they've never seen before it's not it's not other artists that are watching your videos these are laymen who are perhaps purchasing your art so you might be showing a particular you know saw that you're using to cut something that they've never seen before so using that see and say will be helpful and finally again i know um, we're all professional and we probably haven't practiced speaking into camera ever or in that in a long time but you're doing this in the comfort of your own studio i recommend practice 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 you're doing this on your iphone so you can record it once look at it do your own self-critical uh, assessment and if you know, perhaps something different for the second take it might take you three to five takes before you are comfortable with each segment that you develop and don't feel that you're bad at it that's typical and normal i mean We've all seen the bloopers at the end of films, right? Where, they, where professional actors have messed up their lines, right? So don't be too hard on yourself if it takes you a few times to get your intro down. Um, the only thing you're really investing in this is your own time and it's worth getting it right, okay? So I'm gonna provide you a typical outline, but you can make your uh, film in your studio tour however you want but this is a starting point okay so uh, you want to introduce yourself first um, i definitely recommend you take your artist statement and you modify it for speaking we've all written artist statements for gallery openings or for our websites or for um, getting into an art fair and you've probably rewritten it a couple of dozen times but remember, your artist statement right now is to be read. It's written, it's written to be read. What I want you to do is write it to be said because we speak differently than we write. We don't speak in full sentences sometimes. Um, and I think it's important that when you are introducing you, yourself that you come off natural and conversational. So just reading an artist statement won't won't feel natural or conversational. So, but your artist statement is who you are and why you do what you do. And you put time and effort into come up with that those pros, right? So it should be a launching pad or foundational piece to your introduction. So take that and start with that. Now, I've seen some studio tours that start with a clever little clip of something unique. And I'm okay with that too, that can draw your audience in. So it doesn't necessarily have to start with you as a talking head. You could have something fun to open it up for the first few seconds to get people excited. Um, but if you just wanna try something simple to start with, you could follow this particular outline. So now you've produced your uh, talking points for your introduction and you've recorded your introduction the next thing I recommend is to do your your tour of your studio now this can take anywhere from you know two minutes to six minutes it does you know don't spend too long on this because literally it's just a tour but you're going to show the area that you work in and why it works for you so you want to tell a story about your studio that makes it unique or special. So yes, you are going to show your painting easel, right? Here's my painting easel. But tell me something about that painting easel. Is there, uh, did you find it? Was it a gift? Um, was it a hand-me-down from another artist? Um, did you adapt it a certain way for your painting style? Try to make your storytelling here interesting and not just, like I mentioned before, using see and say, but building something a little more compelling and intimate behind the see and say, okay? Then I also, so now you've done your studio tour, now we're gonna dig a little deeper and we're gonna show your tools and what you do to create your art. And here I think is an opportunity to um, elevate the content a little bit more. I didn't see a lot of, I didn't see any of this, 
um, in any of the videos that I looked at, and maybe because people want to keep their secrets secret, that could be true. Uh, however, by sharing a little secret about how you use your tools, again, is that sneak peek, the looking, you know, the peek behind the curtain that makes your audience feel special. So a good example would be, um, you know, maybe you're an abstract acrylic painter and you have some unique tools that you use to create form in your paint. And one of them happens to be, you know, your grandpa's old comb and you cut a couple teeth out of that comb and you use that to create some really cool effects in your paint. Now that's a really neat little story. It's not a secret by any means, but it adds a little character to the fact that you're showing the tools in which you use to, to paint. And then, so once you've kind of provided that little insight, you now want to be actually be able to demonstrate your work. And um, I want you to show a piece that you're currently working on and then you're gonna demonstrate your process. And uh, hopefully, you know, like they do in cooking shows is a great example, right? So they'll show, actually that's probably the best analogy there. They'll show all the ingredients and then they'll show that ingredients already mixed in a bowl. And then they'll show the stuff mixed in a bowl and then they'll show the stuff that's mixed in a bowl on the stove already pre-cooked. And that, you know how they kind of will take you through that process? So, you know, set some, set some time up to do that, to be able to show raw materials, to work in process, to where you're actually working on the piece. And I, the, the tip I have here for you is, as you're working on your piece, I want you to narrate what you are doing as if a blind person is watching. So let's say you're painting and um, you pick out a brush, I want you to describe that brush. Well, I'm gonna use a horsehair brush for this because I love the way that it holds the paint. And now I'm gonna pre-mix the paint on my palette and I'm using this deep tinted burgundy, but I'm gonna add a little white in there because I wanna soften up the hue. And I'm using this palette knife that I got at Home Depot, it was on sale. And I always like to pre-mix my art on the palette before I put it on the canvas. And you can see how I'm mixing it and, and it's getting a nice consistency. So, you know, basically I'm just making this up right now, but I'm talking through what I'm doing. It's almost like a Bob Ross approach for those of you that were mesmerized watching Bob Ross videos. I mean, he's definitely having a moment right now, but um, you know, he was very good at the see and say and narrating his painting technique as he did it. And it just drew you in as an audience, right? If there's something magical, I mean, I, I think half the audience was just drooling watching him because they were just in this trance. And that's what you want to do, same thing. So now you've, you know, you've finished your demonstration and now it's time to wrap up the segment. And again, remember, we're going to use that tip of tell them what you told them, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. Here's where you are going to state again why you're special and why your work is unique. You can grab some key phrases from your artist statement that are worth repeating and repeat them here. And then always end your video with a reason to stay engaged with you. It could, and that's up to you. It could be to subscribe to your YouTube channel, like your page, shop your store, visit you at a retailer or a gallery, but there should be some sort of call to action where you're asking that audience that just invested, you know, 12 minutes in your video to engage with you for the next opportunity. And uh, you also want to include that in the video, but you also should be including in your copy. We'll talk about that. All right, so I want to pause here, Mark. Are there any questions so far that anyone has? Yes, we have a question from Sharon. Sharon, are you ready? I am. Hi, Mark. I first have Hi. to say this is an extremely well done presentation. I just love it. And the, the analogy to cooking shows is so visual. Thank you. But anyway, my question, my question was, um, artists have varying de degrees of being personable and, and, and on camera. So I'm wondering if an alternative uh, for them is to do the same process, but have a tour guide or 
interviewer or such a person with them? You know, Sharon, that's a great idea. If uh, And I find that like, let's maybe it's a spouse or a daughter or a son interviewing you, you could add that little levity and that comfort and that ease that you might need, right? Because the most important thing is that you come across as being human. And none of us are perfect. And you just, you just wanna be yourself. Um, and that's why practice makes perfect too. And that's why editing is gonna be your best right. friend. So, so yeah, I love that suggestion. That's a great suggestion. So for those of you that didn't hear that question, Sharon made a suggestion, if you're not comfortable with being on camera, maybe having a partner um, help you through the process, whether it's through the interview or maybe in your studio, asking you questions about your studio so that you could just answer them live. As I said, remember you're like talking to your best friend. Well, maybe if you just have your best friend standing next to you. That's a brilliant idea, Sharon. Thank you for sharing. All right, so now we're moving on to the next section, which is technical preparation. So the first thing you wanna do is select your locations. Now, obviously it's gonna be your studio, but your interview and some of the other parts of it don't necessarily have to be in your studio. So you might wanna be um, do your introduction or your wrap up on your front porch or in a park. That's completely up to you. It's important that it reflects who you are as an artist and reflects your brand. And, uh, but it's important to think about it in advance. The composition of your studio is also important. So I've given you some good examples of continuums here with someone who's like so messy, it makes me nervous looking at that picture on the top to someone who's so organized, I don't even think he's doing the painting himself, right? <laughs> it's like he spent some time organizing that studio. But ultimately, what you wanna think about is, you know, we're all artists. And so we all understand the importance of composition. And so your studio is nothing more than a composition that you are going to stage for the purpose of this video. So remove clutter and straighten it up. Everything should have a purpose. And I want you to look at your studio through as though it's the first time you're seeing it. So you might have not noticed the pile of rags sitting on the shelf there for two months. And then all of a sudden, when you're looking at through a fresh set of eyes, you see them now. And they don't need to be there. They need to be where they're supposed to be, right? And everything should be purposefully placed. And how are you going to frame up each shot? So I want you to think about staging. And I want you to think about when you're preparing for your video, to think about the foreground, the midground, and the background. And I think... For it to be interesting, I want you to prop it appropriately. So let's say you're sitting in a chair and um, you're being interviewed. You, you, let's say you got your best friend asking you questions and you're a painter. Why not put like a, an old tin can with some um, paint brushes, like, a, like almost like a flower arrangement sitting in the foreground that's just out of, just in view, but out of view. And then that your background is interesting and that you've got something over your shoulder that is unique and helps you know, support the story that you're telling. So again, compose your shots, your artists, you, you know how to do this. So think about art in your studio is the best way of putting it. From an attire point of view, your wardrobe and your hair and makeup should just reflect what your brand is. When you do a studio show and let's say you're an artist that always wears black, then you should be wearing black in your studio tour. If you're known for big chunky jewelry, um, specifically for the interview portion, wear the big chunky jewelry. You know, if you're in your studio, be authentic. If you've got your coveralls on, with all the paint everywhere, I think people want to see that, right? So the most important thing is be yourself and be authentic, be who you are. So let's go and talk a little bit about controlling lighting. Now, this is really important because lighting will set the mood and it also will help with engagement. If your studio is too dark, like on this picture on the left, I'm, I'm not engaging in the studio. Remember, it's not even a very interesting picture. But the picture on the right, which where she's well lit, lit and the art is well lit, I'm gonna pay attention to what she's doing because I can see it with good lighting. 
It's also important that your face is lit and any of your work is lit. And what I'm going to recommend is something you can do in your own home. You do not have to go out and purchase any professional lighting kits. Matter of fact, this link right here will take you to a quick video about how to set up your studio using lights in your own home or, or studio. So most importantly, you want soft lighting, not harsh lighting. And there are three types of light you want to focus on. Your key light is your main light, and that's usually going to be on one side of your face or not. And then you're going to have background and fill light, right? A background light can be something as simple as a table lamp um, or an accent lamp that you just put on the shelf in the back. And the purpose of background lighting is to separate you from your environment because you don't want to look flat on the screen. You want to have some depth, okay? And then the um, other thing that I want you to be careful of is overhead lighting because if you have recessed lighting, which a lot of artists do in their studios, if you're standing directly under a bulb, it'll cast those or cast uh, those crazy cast those crazy shadows on your face and onto your chest. So unscrew that bulb um, and don't have overhead lighting. Um, if it's behind you, it can work as a nice uh, backlight, which is always good. Like if you see in some interviews, where the top of the person's head and the back of their shoulder is lit, that also helps dimension. So um, if you're going to sit under a light, make sure that light is behind you and it's purposefully creating separation between you and your background. Um, probably the easiest thing to do is using windows for light. Windows are great fill. So I have a natural light to me here. I'm gonna go ahead and close the door, this bedroom here. And it kind of takes a little bit of the fill light out. But if I open the door, I get a little more fill light um, on the side of my face. It's not, not a lot, but it's a little bit that just adds to the ambiance a little bit. And the last thing you want to do is make sure you don't have the window behind you so you get that silhouette effect. It's, uh, that's not good. Okay, any questions? So Nicola wanted uh, us to address this question or for her. Um, She's got a common concern, which is she's very comfortable with showing her space, but she's much less comfortable showing herself or even necessarily speaking herself. Okay. There, you know what? I think there's nothing wrong with having somebody introduce you um, and having someone do the voiceover. And we're going to talk about doing voiceover in a little bit. Um, maybe you could use photography as an option instead of video. So maybe you have some nice photography of you working in your, with your art, right? Or photography, a nice, perhaps nice profile picture. And maybe you can in introduce yourself that way. I mean, people do want to know the artist, um, unless you're like Banksy and you're se secretive. Um, there, there is some intrinsic value in knowing the artist of the work that you buy. I mean, most of us, and I read who joined, well, most of us are handmade artists. We're one of a kind. Not a lot of us are production. And there were some ceramists in there, but even then, you're putting your stamp on the bottom of the mug or the plate. You, you are the brand that you are selling. Your art is not a commodity. Your art has intrinsic value because you made it with your hands. And the way to create value in that is to let your clients know who you are. Being uncomfortable is normal. You're not alone. Speaking in front of people, even if it's on camera, I think is as, as scary as death, as I, I've read before. So there are ways around that, using photography, having someone else do a voiceover, but I still think it's important they get to know you. And maybe someone can film the demonstration and then do the voiceover of the demonstration later for you. So let's talk about the camera shots themselves. All right, so uh, you don't have to be a professional cameraman, uh, but you need to know a couple of things about uh, a camera. This is probably where most of the video tours fail miserably, okay? So first and foremost, make sure your phone is charged and that you have enough memory. If you have a tripod, and, and I hope you do, a lot of people have tripods, 
from the old days when they had cameras and they were the family photographer. Um, you can get a simple adapter that fits into a tripod for your iPhone. They're like eight bucks from Amazon. They're not expensive, uh, but you don't have to have that. But if you do, uh, try to get one with a handle so that you can use your, your, your pans and your tilts and they can be nice and smooth. Not necessary, but it is preferred method, okay? If you are gonna handhold the camera, the thing, the recommendation I have for you is you must move much slower than your eyes naturally move. That's the big problem that most people do is they hold their camera and they do the shot as if they're looking at it with their own eyes. But when you're, look, it's almost like being on a virtual roller coaster when you watch those videos. It makes you, your stomach a little bit queasy. So I want you to slow it down and steady it. And my tip is to use long exhales of your breath to steady your hand. So you're simply going to breathe in and breathe out as you move your camera. And that will slow and steady your move, okay? So the first shot that you're gonna take is an establishing shot of your studio. And that's gonna be a long shot with a slow pan from left to right. So you're just gonna hold your camera up and you're gonna start at one side and you're gonna breathe out. <sighs> and it's about that fast. And it should last anywhere from two, three, four, five seconds, depending on the size of your studio. Don't worry about the front and the back end because I'm gonna teach you how to trim each of those segments, okay? And it's good for people to know where they are before you start showing them the details. They wanna kind of get a lay of the land and that's called an establishing shot. The next shot you're gonna do is your interview shot. And again, this is highlighted green. So I have a supplemental video that you can watch that will give you tips about how to set up an interview shot. You wanna shoot from your chest up, and you wanna control the space around your head and your shoulders, it should be equal. You know, you don't want, you know, to see ceiling tiles, and you don't wanna make it one of those Kardashian shots, where you know, you're 45 off trying to get rid of the chin, right? right? We all wanna get rid of the chin, right? It should be right eye level, right, uh, with the camera, and, and that's where you should be shooting. Then you wanna talk about your feature shot, and your feature shots are going to be the special areas in your studio. So there's going to be a little more camera movement here, not a lot, but this is where you might want to take your camera and let's say you're showing um, a shelving unit where you store all of your equipment. You're going to start at the top. You're going to use your breath like I talked about before. Breathe out. Nice and slow. And you're going to do that, you know, up, down, side. Mix it up a little bit because you want the you want the final piece to be interesting. So tilts, pans, those are probably the only two that you're going to need. Zooming, we're going to handle in post, so don't worry about moving in or moving out. We'll handle all that in post. Okay, and then your demonstration shot. Now um, this is going to be an over the shoulder in most cases, so you can, you know duct tape your phone to a side of a box or something so that it's right here and, and it has a good view of your hands and your work area. Um, and you don't really need to move around that much with that, but you want to have some sort of an overhead or over the shoulder shot, kind of tight on the work. But you want to bring your audience in so they can see what you're doing. And there is also, for those of you that will be doing more of these, like let's say, you know what? I want to be doing more demonstration videos. It may be worth setting up a boom system or a rig system to do that. And there's a demonstration video here to show you how to do that with a couple of things you can purchase at Home Depot. Okay, sound design. So uh, the iPhone has a pretty good camera. It's not a bad camera or bad audio uh, microphone, uh, but you know it could be a little bit better. So your voice is really the most important element because this is infotainment. You're giving them information as well as entertaining. So if you sound like a tin can, and that could be like a lot of studios, in my studio, I've got cement floor, 
and I've got metal everywhere. There's nothing to absorb the sound. So I would want to use like blankets on the walls or blankets on the floor to absorb the sound. Of course, those would be off camera, but something to, to absorb any kind of uh, bounciness. Um, if you're muffled, you're gonna have to get closer to the mic or maybe farther away, depending. But again, practice make per makes perfect, uh, per uh, perfection. And then be careful of background noises. Um, dogs barking, which they have a tendency to do right at the worst time, uh, high traffic areas. Um, I watched a, a studio uh, interview and the woman was on her porch, it was a beautiful scene, but there must have been a bird's nest like right there and the birds just kept chirping and chirping and it was really annoying. And I'm sure they didn't hear it, um, but the camera picked it up. Uh, so, you know, close your windows, close your doors to eliminate outside sounds, you know, pay your kids off with cookies and iPad time, to keep them quiet for a half hour or so, but manage your sound design. And then this link here, again, for those of you that are perhaps interested in doing more videos than just one, here's a link to take a look at some external microphones that are from cheap to expensive um, that you might want to take a look at that might be worth. Um, taking a look at. Um, but most of your audio will be managed in post-production. And we're going to talk a little bit about this on the app that you can get on your phone. Um, you want to add music, most likely at the intro and the extra of your video, just to create some energy and create a tone. You can do that in post. You can also add some music, perhaps during your demonstration, if there's long gaps of silence, for example. Or if you're, let's say, you know, you're sawing something, right? Or, um, you know, you, you don't want to hear the saw sound. You might put, like, take the sound of the saw down a little bit and make the music a little higher. But that's personal preference on how you want to do it. The thing that you can do too is you can record your voiceover separately for better audio quality. So, not to mention, you know, you're holding your camera. You're getting pushing the record button and you want to make sure it's steady and you're breathing and you're, you're doing the top to button. You know, your, your mind is thinking about doing all of those things and not necessarily thinking about what you want to say. So you might, especially if you're not comfortable doing this, do all of your, we call it B-roll, and then drop the voiceover on later. And then that way you can control what you say and how long uh, the segment is. Okay, and then like I said, you can always invest in an external mic if you plan on doing this. All right, I wanna talk a little bit about the app. So I've done a lot of research, I've used a lot of apps, I've been doing videos for a while, and like I said, I, I have a background in production, and the InShot is by far the best, and it's free. So it's an all-in-one app, it edits videos and images, and you can make videos of both video clips and images, which I think is gonna be important. You can also make changes to your videos, your photos, you can create collages with photos within the application. And there's a range of editing tools, pretty much everything that you're gonna need. I have a quasi-professional editing um, a tool that I use on my, PC, my uh, computer, and I can pretty much do the same thing on my iPhone app. Um, it's obviously a little more difficult to do because you know, you're doing it with your finger on your iPhone app, but it serves its purpose, okay? If you wanna download the app, here's the link, or you can just go to your app store and type in InShot and look for this little red logo and download it from there. Now let's talk about why I love it so much. So um, I was planning on doing a complete demonstration, but you know what? Someone's already done it and they did it better than I could do it. So when you're done and you get this deck and you are serious about using the, I, uh, the InShot app, go to this YouTube uh, link here and watch, it's a 20 minute video and it takes you through the features and this woman does a fantastic job in explaining and what she'll take you through are basically all of the features. But when you're ready to edit your video, you wanna do it in this order, because it's gonna make your life a little easier. The first thing you wanna do 
is to input all your videos and pictures, okay? Whatever you think you're gonna use, import it, right? Then the next thing you wanna do is determine your canvas size. One of the neatest features of this app is it can uh, resize your, uh, your mediums based on your social platform. So for example, Instagram uses squares, YouTube uses 16 by nine. So depending on where you're going to put this video, you can format it to the size you want. Um, it also allows you to zoom in to certain video segments with just like, a, like, like you know how you zoom in on a photo with your finger? It's the same thing. You're just using your fingers to size the video. So let's say you did a, a demonstration and you were too far away, just zoom it in. Now, of course, you don't want to zoom in too much because you'll lose the integrity and the quality of the film, but it's great for just getting things a little tighter. It's also really simple to reorder and your move and your and move your video clips around so you can just simply hold and drag them along the video bar so it's very easy to do and like i mentioned before every video is going to start with you pushing the button like you've seen those facebook live videos and people are looking at the screen and they're like all right what do i got to do to start this right it's very uncomfortable and a little unprofessional um, you can edit all that out by just a simple little tag at the end of the segment and drag it to the point where you want to trim. And then you can also split it in half. So it provides all those edit features. So now you've got, you've imported it, you've, you've formatted all your videos to where you want, the segments to where you want it, you've got it in the right order, right? Now you can adjust the speed and select backgrounds. So like I mentioned, let's say you're sawing something or you're grinding something. Well, that's not that fun to use. You can speed that segment up to look at it like seven times faster. And it also creates a little energy. Or let's say you're doing something and you maybe want to slow down to show a brush stroke, right? That's something you're doing on a brush stroke. So it allows you to change the speed of each individual clip. Then you can also select backgrounds, which is nice because you're going to shoot. You, I always recommend you shoot this way, right? This is 16 by 9. This is how it'll look on YouTube. But let's say um, you want to put the 16 by 9 into Instagram and it's a square. So what the canvas will do, will add a little top on here and a little bottom on here. And then you can add different colors in here. And then you can do patterns. And what's nice is it creates a nice little banner for maybe some text. So if you want to add like, you know, follow me on uh, Instagram or I'm using this type of paint, you know, or whatever you want to say, like we talked about see and say. So see and say can also mean see supporting what you're doing with text. So I'm hearing you say it, I, I'm reading what you're doing, and I'm seeing what you're doing. That really creates strong comprehension, that three-point strategy. Um, you can add filters. So let's say you want the whole thing to be in black and white or you want a special effect to the film, um, or you want to add stickers, which I don't necessarily recommend, but you, know, you could add some stickers. Like maybe uh, towards the end of the video, you uh, want people to follow you on YouTube. You might have like little arrows pointing down at the link or something like that, but they have all of that available. And as I mentioned, you can add text. They have about 12 different fonts you can use, which are plenty. You can change the colors of the fonts. You can align them, align it differently. You can move it all around. Um, you can make it big, small, and even can add animation to the fonts. So again, it just creates more energy, more uh, comprehension, more interest. You know, adding text to your videos is great. And if let's say that's something that you think you want to do, then make sure you all you frame up your video. So let's say, I always want to have right above my shoulder, I want to have a little text box that's going to um, give a tip. Like maybe it's going to be tip of the day. I'm making this up, so tip of the day. And you want that tip of the day always to show up right here on this part of the screen. Well then, when you're setting up your studio and you're setting up your frames, make sure you leave some space up there for that text to go. And this will come easy over time. Okay, so now you um, 
you got all the video done and you have it in the right order and you have the speeds adjusted and you got your text on there. So now you're going to add your music and you're going to record your voiceover. So this particular app has a pretty good selection of music. It's a little difficult. It's, uh, it's done by albums and they're just, a lot of them are mostly instrumental. So it takes a while to figure out what you want to do and which music will work for your, um, for the feel and the tone, but it's worth the hunt. You can always import from iTunes if you want, um, or you can actually record your own music if you're an artist in that way. Um, it also allows you to control the ambient sound of each segment. So let's say um, I'm doing a, a shot of um, my establishing shot and a train goes by, right? Well, I could get, I, you know, so I hear the, the train in the background or a dog barks or something like that. Within this app, I can turn the sound down or off of that segment um, and then record something on top of that. I can either, I can add the music and I can add voiceover. So it has all those tools for you to use. Um, and then the next element after you've got your music and your voiceover done is doing transitions between segments. Now, a lot of people get really crazy with the transitions. So they're, um, and you don't want to be too crazy, right? Uh, they really should, a transition, a strong transition should imply a new topic or a time lapse, right? And then you can have a hard transition. Otherwise, the transition should be natural, like a simple fade or, um, you know, just a cut. You don't get, don't get too crazy with the transitions um, and use those purposefully to introduce a new topic or to show a time lapse. So now your video is done and you simply push export and it will export it directly into a, a MP4 file to your phone, uh, which is the file that's used in all social media, or you can load it directly to social media. So I can, I can, um, create a video in less than a minute now. Um, and I use these short videos for, um, I'll do pictures of um, my progress. I like to do work in progress. So I'll show, uh, I'll take a picture of the raw metal. Maybe I'll do some video of the raw metal. I'll take um, a picture of uh, like where the piece is partially welded. And then I'll take a picture of the piece being finished. And then sometimes I even get a picture of the piece in my client's home. And then I'll just edit those, those images together, um, put a little nice music bed underneath it and some text talking about the process. And I can do all of that in a minute. It's that easy once you get good at it. I should also mention there is a pro version that you can pay like $2.99 a month and you get more features, but I have not needed them. I, I feel like the free stuff is fine. So some people were wondering whether these programs are just for uh, the iPhone or whether they'd work on the iPad or on Android phones. They do work on Android. I'm not sure about the iPad. I think, the, I, you know, I guess it depends on the equipment. Um, I'm, I'm almost sure that all iPhone apps work on an iPad, but that's a good question. I'm not sure. So your video's done. Now what do you do with your video content? So I'm gonna do a little pitch here for the importance of video. Video marketing is three times more engaging than a photo and 10 times more engaging than copy. Now as artists, none of us are just doing copy posts. We're all doing uh, photo posts. So we're already halfway there. But video or anything with movement is going to stop that forever scroll that people are going through their phone, right? Um, there's so much documentation on this. I highly recommend that even if they're short little six second uh, vignettes, um, it helps. So even if, let's say you're showing a new uh, piece of pottery that you made, you know, just being able to zoom in on it or edit a couple pieces together would be great. And you don't have to do video all the time, but it's something that should be part of your marketing repertoire, okay? So that's my pitch on why video is important. Okay how to promote you. 
Now, this is somewhat of a repeat of other seminars, so I apologize for those of you that have attended, you know, how to promote yourself on social media. So this should be familiar, uh, but that's okay. It's always good to hear something twice. So here's what I'm going to recommend for each of you. If you're serious about um, promoting your content, is to define your content by subject matters, or let's just call them buckets because it's a nice visual. So the first thing you want to do is create a bucket of just celebrating your art, and that's posting your finished work, right? And I think most of us do that right now. The next bucket would be promoting an event, and many of us do that also. So what we're doing here is we're creating our third bucket, which is our behind the scenes bucket. And this is where I think the video can play an important role. This is your st studio tour. This is showing your work being made. Um, this could be um, you at a live gallery, in an opening event. Um, you know, this is where your video is gonna come alive. And what I recommend is a simple content calendar to schedule your promotional messages. Honestly, Facebook makes this so simple. If you have a Facebook page, you can go to their scheduler and there's a count. You can basically build a calendar out a month in advance. Um, if you're not used to promoting your product socially, then start with two times a week. Um, if you should probably be posting every day. Um, but you want the co content to be fresh so um, and relevant. So don't post just to post. Post when you have something to say um, and make sure that what you're saying is relevant to your audience. Uh, it's always important to have a call to action. What do you want the audience to do next? Do you want them to share your post? Do you want them to visit your store? Do you want them to click on a link to go look at a longer video? So make sure you have a call to action in everything that you post. Next, I'd like you to make content specific, unique and interesting. And again, images and videos should support that messaging. And we kind of talked here about how to do that on a video. So I know you'll be a pro at that moving forward. Each of the media platforms have kind of their own purpose their own strengths. Facebook um, is the largest social media platform out there. It's still the beast of all beasts. Regardless of what is going on in the news, they are still growing and still inventing and um, people are still engaging. And this is really your business platform, okay? This is where you provide more detail. You can um, you know, provide um, your a storefront, um, you can provide, people can do reviews of you, um, it's a great place for long form, it's a great place to post events if you're having a special sale or, or a gallery opening, it's, it's just kind of, a, it is your storefront, okay? Instagram, on the other hand, skews much younger, so I, that's mostly a younger audience using it. Um, it's a great place for fun pictures with strong call to action, it's a great place to really use hashtags. Over 50% of my engagements come from a hashtag. So I do recommend that you use it for that. Um, Twitter is about joining conversations or starting conversations. So that's also a place where you can engage. And then finally, um, if you don't have one, a newsletter is a great way to create loyalty uh, amongst your followers. So quickly, again, another repeat, but worth sharing now that you have uh, an idea of what you got to create for a video, I want you to think about what that means as far as what text you're going to use, the photography you're going to use, and your video. So text, less is more. Tone and vernacular should reflect your brand, very important. You want your messaging to align with your content objectives. Uh, and then you, what do you want your audience to do? So those four things, every time you write a post, you know, edit, make sure it's tight. Is the tone of vernacular good? Does it align with what I wanna say? And what's my call to action? Um, and that should just come naturally to you after a while. Photography, um, if you're a photographer, it is what it is, but let's say you're a jeweler or you're a sculpt you do sculpture, ceramics, you need to take 
photography of your work. And you want your photography style to also reflect your brand. So are you moody? Are you optimistic? Are you classy? Are you homey? Like what's your brand all about? And your photography should reflect that. And then create a library because you're going to want to have access to photography um, to fill your content buckets. And so for example, let's say you decide you want to add a content bucket of um, holidays. Okay, so I'm going to have a content bucket and I'm going to post something every holiday. So the more content you have, the more it'll be easier for you to post something on Father's Day, Memorial Day, Fourth of July, right? Or National Hot Dog Month or whatever, you know, the, the holiday happens to be. So you want to make sure that you're you have a good library, it's organized, it's fresh, and it's relevant to whatever the message is. Now video, like we just talked about, we're gonna create our, our content for our buckets there. And I recommend that a promotional video be about 15 seconds. So, and any long form should be, it could be two minutes or longer. So the videos that we're talking about today of your studio tour, can be you know five to 12 to 20 minutes just depending on what you're doing right your demonstration could take a, a long time again as long as it's entertaining and energetic and it's purposeful the length doesn't matter store your videos on either your website or your youtube channel try not to put your long form um, uh, items on your uh, facebook page or your instagram because there, it's mostly the short stuff in those areas. And then you can always have a link to the long form. And don't forget to include your call to action. So your call to action sh could and should be in your video. However, if you're creating a video that is more evergreen, that you might wanna repurpose over and over again, then maybe you want, you wanna include that call to action just in the call. Okay. Promoting your studio tour. So now you've completed a long form video and what I'd like you to do is to create short 15 second promotional videos from that long form so for example um, you could like create curiosity right um, you want them to be want to entertain them for example um, you might want to leave your audience learning more you want to make sure you have a strong open and a good call to action on those 15 seconds. And then post your long form studio tour on your foundational platform where we talked about YouTube or website, and make sure you include your call to action. So now you're ready to start your promotion and start promoting your tour. So let's say you're gonna post every other day using your new assets. So let's say you create four 15 second promotional videos. So you can probably, you know, take a couple of weeks and start promoting um, your studio tour and um, hopefully get some engagement. A good time to promote or post your tour would be around an event, like maybe right before an art fair or um, maybe you have a gallery opening or something that's coming. That would be a good time to promote your uh, tour because you want them to watch your tour, but then you also want them to purchase your work. So it could be like maybe you have a show in a gallery or like I said, you have an art fair coming up. Um, and then don't forget um, Twitter, even text is a great way. You've got a good text group, email, messenger, or even LinkedIn because you are a business and you're promoting your business. LinkedIn might be a good resource to also promote your video. Then I also want you to make sure you review your comments um, and respond every day to those comments because you want to be known as being responsive and engaging with your audience. And so make sure while you are out there promoting your video that you're staying on top of any comments or likes or shares um, and that you're responding to those. And make sure you review your overall analytics when, when, when you're done and see, you know, was there any themes? What did you learn? Um, when you Take a look at your YouTube video where people, because you know how, new, I don't know if you know this, but YouTube will give you some good analytics and it'll show you where people, a lot of people are watching and it'll also show you where people are not watching and, and dropping out of your video. 
um, that can give you some insight on maybe what to do in your next video and then apply those learnings to your next one. I want to thank you for joining me. I have, I'm posting, um, I have a long form video that was produced professionally for me. I was very fortunate to get this. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at it, not because I want you to learn more about me, but this was done by a professional. It was done by the Farmington Hills Arts Council. And if you look at it constructively about how the video was put together and how things were framed up and how the voiceover came in over video or the voice or how they use pictures, it might help you form how you want to edit your video. So feel, feel free to steal shamelessly on how this was edited and put together for your own personal video. Anybody watch American Idol or The Voice? So they weren't able to finish their shows during the finale. And their producers were smart enough that in order for people to stay tuned in, they couldn't just have the artist play a piece of music in their den, right? Or sing a song that they would, they would tune out. So they literally sent green screens and fancy cameras. And even those shows have been overproduced. We are so, as human beings, we are so used to overproduction that something simple without music or text or something blinking at us, we tune out. We, we're, a, we're a society of ADD uh, media consumption consumers, right? Like we need to have all of that motion. And so again, you're trying to break through. You're breaking through the clutter. You're trying to make your mark. You're trying to distinguish yourself as an artist. Um, and that doesn't mean you need to be loud and flashy. Um, you could be quiet and serene and do it that way too. Uh, but I think you're going to find that uh, once you start editing, it's, it's going to be second nature. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the seminar and I can't wait to see all your great videos. So thank you.